It is Wednesday, January 17th, and this is The National. Tonight, he spent three years alone in a French prison waiting for a trial that never happened. Now, in an exclusive television interview, Hassan Diab tells us about his first amazing hours back home in Canada. Millions of pregnant women in this country have turned to this drug for relief. Questions now about how much diclectin really helped with their morning sickness. But we begin with an economic announcement that might hit you on your household's bottom line. Uh, everybody's better off with a stronger economy. A uh, stronger economy means that interest rates can move a little closer to something more normal um, in a context in which everybody's better off. So raise the interest rate is exactly what the Bank of Canada did today, up a quarter of a percent to 1.25. Canada's big banks have now all raised their rates by the same amount. And despite the economy's strength, top bank officials say there is still uncertainty and reason to worry. Yeah, that's really household that's keeping me up at yeah. night. Yeah. Um, and not so much that I think uh, it's just a vulnerability that we would face if we had if we had a shock there's plenty of reason to there's another big unknown on the economic horizon and we'll get to that in a minute but first we asked Jacqueline Hansen to look at what today's rate hike means to Canadians many of us with increasing amounts of debt and maybe tonight a bigger mortgage too this is one of the larger one plus dam a third rate hike in seven months is forcing a generation that has only known ultra low rates to think differently about debt and some already are. It is one of the bigger ones for sure, like you said. Darshit and Reedy yeah. said want to be first-time home buyers in Toronto. Please now stop doing things that we can't afford yeah. because it's just because you end up liking it and yeah. if you like it too much you would have that conversation of overstretching yourself which we don't want to do. They've been waiting for the right time to get in. We had the foreign uh, buyer rule come in, we had the increase in interest rates come in and the beginning yeah. of this year stress test uh, come in but we're not yet seeing any softening in the marketplace. Uh, there are still At least people. not for condos. They are hopeful that higher interest rates will help squeeze out some of the home buying competition as borrowers become more limited on how far they can extend themselves, especially if rates continue to go up. This is a rising rates environment, one we haven't had for quite some time that Canadian consumers will have to adjust to. Most analysts are expecting at least one, perhaps two, more hikes by the central bank this year. We're now going to be in a different paradigm where we have to, for the first time in a long time, recognize that interest rates are rising and a lot of these behaviors that developed over the last decade will have to unwind. I like the dent too. Difficult, but perhaps necessary for consumers and businesses that have been relying on ultra-cheap credit and digging deeper into debt for years. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. So strong economic growth in Canada was behind today's rate hike, but the bank is keeping a cautious eye on the United States as it looks ahead. David Cochran has that. Interest rates are going up because just about everything in the Canadian economy is going right, and the Bank of Canada says government spending is a big reason why. Uh, we would still have a sizable output gap in the economy were it not for the fiscal actions that have been taken. That's a technical way of saying the economy wouldn't be doing nearly as well if it wasn't for the Trudeau government's decisions to boost child benefits to families and spend big on infrastructure, which Polos, like the Liberals, calls an investment, even if it means a deficit. Some of these things are worth actually borrowing for. In short, Polos suggests a liberal approach to now has worked, but there are problems ahead that can be summarized in one word. Trump. The hot Canadian economy would be scorching if not for the wet blanket of NAFTA uncertainty. Companies unsure of where the talks will go are either sitting on their money or putting it elsewhere. Well, they face a decision about whether or not um, you know, it's just safer given the uncertainty to just do the investment in the U.S. So at best, some economic expansion in Canada has been delayed by NAFTA. At worst, it has been lost entirely to the United States. And there are other problems. While Trump threatens to thicken the Canada-U.S. border, he has slashed American corporate taxes, bringing them down to a rate comparable to Canada's. What you have is, is what used to be a strong advantage for Canada is being lost. You add to that the uncertainty that we have as a result of NAFTA, 
and people making business investments are saying, where am I better to make that investment? That's not a problem for the Bank of Canada to solve. That's up to the government. They've chosen to spend big to jolt the economy. Now they face pressure to cut taxes to keep those gains. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, moving on now, and Rosemary, you interviewed a man many of us had heard little about, but he has a story worth listening to. Absolutely, Ian. Uh, before he spoke to me, though, Canadian professor Hassan Diab spoke to reporters after being held in a French prison. Justice has finally <coughs> prevailed. I can start with this. Miracles can happen still these days. I'm beyond thrilled to see my wife and children and to finally be able to hug them outside the confines of a prison cell. That is Hassan Diab speaking publicly today for the first time just after leaving France, where he was kept in solitary confinement for more than three years. He was there because Canada agreed to extradite him to face terror-related charges. He was freed because a French court finally recognized there was insufficient evidence. Not, not enough to convict him, not enough to even justify a trial. That's important, and it raises a perplexing question for Canada and Canadians. It all began when France received questionable intelligence linking Diab to the fatal 1980 bombing of a Paris synagogue. They sought his extradition, and Canada complied. I have been living a Kafkaesque nightmare. He spent three years under house arrest, then was handed over, though the Canadian judge who allowed it said France had a weak case. Since then, French judges have shot holes in the case and ordered his release several times, but prosecutors kept appealing on the basis of public safety. His charges were finally dismissed, and while that could still be appealed, France let him return home this weekend. I don't want any penny from the taxpayers in Canada. But he does want an inquiry into Canada's extradition law. I sat down with Hassan Diab today and asked him about the law that let him be extradited on dubious evidence. I'm talking about the craziness of this extradition law. So the judge felt, you know, with tight hands, like, I, I can do nothing. But the politicians could have done something, could they not have? Absolutely. The minister, justice minister at the time, could have done a lot because he had the ultimate veto. Even if the judges did what the law, the lousy law, I call it, if uh, the judges did it according to the law, he could have said, no, wait a minute. We get into that and a lot more. The full interview tonight on The National. Pressure on the federal government to overhaul rules on solitary confinement is mounting. B.C.'s Supreme Court ruled today that indefinite solitary confinement in federal prisons is unconstitutional. The B.C. Civil Liberties Association was one of two groups that launched that challenge. For every person that spent time in solitary confinement and for all the prisoners who I know are watching today, I just have a message that I can't, can't leave off. They may try to hide you. Uh, they may try to hide your pain from the rest of the Canadian population, but we actually see you. The court sees you, and we refuse to look away from your pain. Your suffering matters. You matter. You're important. What's been done to you is very, very wrong. Today's victory, it belongs to you. <laughs> The judge suspended his ruling for one year to give Parliament a chance to fix the problem. The federal government has 30 days to announce if it will appeal. It lost a similar case in Ontario last December. Adrian, you've got a story that affects lots of women in this country. You bet. If you have been pregnant in Canada, there is a very good chance you've been prescribed something called Dilectin. That's the morning sickness pill sold to millions of women around the world and advertised by some high-profile figures. A few years ago, TV star Kim Kardashian told millions of her online followers that the pill made her feel a lot better. But there are some questions tonight about how much it actually accomplishes. Vicodopia talks to the researcher who has seen the raw data. For Vanessa Tantalo, her daughter's arrival couldn't come soon enough. I just wake up and throw up immediately within getting up and uh, couldn't get off the couch. Uh, I'd have to stay home from work. Like more than two-thirds of pregnant women, Tantalo had debilitating morning sickness and nausea, and she says Diclectin didn't help. 
Tantalo's experience isn't just anecdotal. This doctor has long questioned whether diclectin actually helps his patients. His research team spent years trying to obtain clinical trial documents held by Health Canada. After signing a confidentiality agreement and examining the raw data, he says the evidence the drug works better than a placebo is slim to almost none. Now I can't bring myself to write a prescription for this medication knowing what I know about it. it Prasad is not alone. Even though the FDA approved the drug, it noted diclectin has a small treatment effect, while European regulators said it does not represent a significant therapeutic benefit over existing treatments. And a recent review by Health Canada also found the clinical trial was problematic and not definitive. But the Quebec-based maker of diclectin insists the clinical trial meets appropriate standards and the drug has been safely prescribed to 35 million women and we found lots of pregnant women who swear by it. Prasad says that's normal, as symptoms often fade on their own. I'm sure there are many women out there who can truthfully say that they got much better after taking the medication. The study suggests that it wasn't because they took the medication. Diclectin seems to have divided doctors. The Journal for the Family Physicians of Canada agrees with Persaud, but the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists stands by the drug because it's safe and there's nothing controversial about the active ingredients, a combination of vitamin B6 and an antihistamine found in common remedies like NyQuil. As for Vanessa Tantalo, her symptoms eventually disappeared without any medication. Vicodopia, CBC News, Brampton, Ontario. So you hear accounts like that, and obviously there's still so many questions that remain unanswered about diclectin. So to try to get a bit of help with this, we're joined by Dr. Danielle Martin. Uh, Dr. Martin, I'm imagining pregnant women sitting at home right now saying, what am I supposed to do now? Right, women and their doctors. You know, in a lot of ways, it reminds me of the common cold. Nausea and vomiting in pregnancy are so common, and they can be debilitating symptoms, and at times they can have significant complications. But as with the common cold, we don't really have very effective treatments. And so that's an uncomfortable place for women and their doctors. And if you look at the evidence on nausea and vomiting in pregnancy, you know, we've looked at ginger, we've looked at uh, mint oil, we've looked at acupuncture, we've now looked at, you know, a wide variety of pills and nothing seems to be particularly effective. And that's an uncomfortable place for women and their doctors. But women should know before they take a prescription medicine and doctors should know before they prescribe it, if there isn't much evidence that it does anything, then it may be that the potential harms outweigh any potential benefit. I know that you know people certainly of a certain generation will, will hear medication and morning sickness and imme immediately think of the problems with thalidomide. This is not that. It sounds like you're saying it, it, it's not going to help but it probably won't hurt. Right, so you know, uh, it's helpful for people to understand that when Health Canada approves a medication, as it has done in the case of diclectin, um, they're primarily looking at issues of safety. And so there's not uh, evidence coming to light about, uh, about diclectin being unsafe. But that's a different question from whether it's effective. And the bar for whether we prescribe a medicine to anybody, whether they're pregnant or not, should be much higher than whether it can be approved to enter the market. And that's a, it's a different conversation. Right, so it's probably not going to be pulled off it's, shelves. I, I can't imagine that it'll be pulled off the shelves, but I, I would expect that the, the rate of prescribing as a result of these uh, new findings should decrease substantially. Okay, Dr. Danielle Martin, thanks very much. Thank you. An extraordinary display of destruction to show you in Quebec today. These are pictures from a drone over the Yamaska River northeast of Montreal where an awe-inspiring ice jam has caused the river to flood. About a dozen homes had to be evacuated. And another ice jam is one in western Newfoundland has residents in the town of Deer Lake on high alert. More fallout after a weekend of heavy rain and warming temperatures that caused the ice to melt on the Humber River for the first time in recent memory. Chris O'Neill Yates is there. Where a few short days ago snowmobilers enjoyed a favorite winter activity on the Humber River. The mayor put homeowners on the riverbank on alert yesterday. It just keeps climbing the way it is. I know it's very slow, but eventually that's going to get in those houses. See the section. One of those houses belongs to Angie Moss. She's never seen the river so high in January in the 14 years she's lived here. I've mainly got most of the things up off the basement floor. Her most precious possessions, safe from the water's reach. The first thing that I moved was photo albums and 
things that you can't get back, that money can't replace, right? A hundred kilometers away, the same storm that caused the ice jam washed out roads, leaving the towns of York Harbor and Lark Harbor completely isolated. We're cut off from Cornerbrook, so it's, that's our lifeline, is our, is our road. We don't have no cell phone service. People with urgent medical issues are being flown to hospital. Local politician Eddie Joyce says the adversity here has brought out the best in people. Hey, the people in the York Harbor and Lark Harbor came together they help so much, uh, and they're very patient, uh, they're very understanding. The end of the emergency is in sight here. Back in Deer Lake, people are still on high alert. We're ready to go. We have a, our action plan, our emergency plan is in place. This ice needs to move downstream, away from these homes before danger is averted. Hour by hour, watching, measuring the water. Hope rises and falls with the mighty Humber River. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, Deer Lake, Newfoundland. We have some video from Puerto Rico we want to show you. Take a look at a moment from the Academia Bautista de Puerto Nuevo, celebrating the return of electricity after 112 days in the dark. They're yelling because school is in the moment the lights turn back on. This video was posted on the school's Facebook page last week with the caption, indisputable joy from all of us. I wonder when the novelty of that is going to wear off, but, you know, electricity on that island is really slowly, slowly coming back. As of today, here's the one number we know. 40 to 45 percent of Puerto Rico is still without power. That is crazy, but hopefully more of these kinds of videos will come out, celebrations, because as of December, 3,500 people from the government power company, the U.S. Army Corps, and private contractors are now working to get people restored. Another 1,000 people expected to arrive by the end of this month. Well, here's what else we are following on The National tonight. Donald Trump's promised fake news awards are out. Who's in and who is out next? Checking in on a promise to make a difference. Last year, Donald Trump and Justin Trudeau started a council to promote women in business. What's still on the to-do list next? And what's in a strain? In the second story of our special Going Legal series, Susan Ormiston finds out if boutique types of cannabis really make a difference in your high. Uh, this is the Katsu Bubba Kush, uh, the screw head, the alien Bubba. This is the Moby Dick. Um, Moby Dick is fantastic for stress and it's got like a really kind of citrusy sweet nose. On The National Tonight, a few weeks after Donald Trump promised to hand out his fake news awards, tonight he delivered, tweeting out the link to a list of the winners, 11 in all. In some cases, massive stories like the investigation into his campaign's possible collusion with Russia, but others pointed to more specific mistakes. In first place, the New York Times columnist Paul Krugman, who, according to the awards, claimed on the day of President Trump's historic landslide victory that the economy would never recover. His actual commentary, by the way, a little more nuanced, and he did write, quote, we could get lucky somehow. Also awarded was Time magazine, which reported the president removed a bust of Martin Luther King Jr. from the Oval Office. Time did report that, and uh, they reported as well it was inaccurate. You may remember the magazine quickly issuing a retraction and apology for the mistake. And CNN also won for, according to the announcement, editing a video to make it appear President Trump defiantly overfed fish during a visit with the Japanese prime minister. The awards page states that the Japanese Prime Minister actually led the way with the feeding. By the way, when he first tweeted the link, it uh, ended up overloading the website. The site went down, but we found the winners in a cache of the page. You know, the first time he set up a date for these awards, he didn't actually deliver on those awards. But by the way, he is not the first to hand them out. Venezuela's President Maduro delivered his fake news awards just a few weeks ago. Probably not who you want to copy, though. News organizations and comedians, for people who didn't follow this, did actively campaign and plan outfits to try and uh, win one of these awards. Donald Trump is an increasingly divisive figure, even within his own Republican Party. There was another dramatic sign of that today. 
the enemy of the people, was how the President of the United States called the free press in 2017. Mr. President, it is a testament to the condition of our democracy that our own President uses words infamously spoken by Joseph Stalin to describe his enemies. This alone should be the source of great shame for us in this body especially for those of us in the president's party, for they are shameful, repulsive statements. Yep, that was Republican Senator Jeff Flake comparing Trump to Stalin. Flake, maybe not surprisingly, gave up a bid for re-election, and ever since then, he's been speaking his mind. Uh, we're going to launch the Canada United States Council for Advancement of Women Entrepreneurs, of which we have some of the great ones in this room, and business leaders. It was almost a year ago that that announcement from the U.S. president had some people wondering about follow-through. Well, now it's delivered a set of recommendations, and women are front and center. Among their suggestions, lowering the cost of childcare, expanding networking opportunities for women, and encouraging both public and private sectors to award more contracts to female entrepreneurs. I spoke today with two members of the council, both women business executives, about the need for Canadian and American governments to adopt the recommendations. Just a month after taking office, President Trump sat across a table from Prime Minister Trudeau as each declared their commitment to helping women in the business world. Uh, whenever I sit down with a woman executive, I know uh, that she has had to overcome significant barriers. We must ensure that our economy is a place where women can work and thrive. Trudeau, a self-declared feminist with a gender-balanced cabinet, had shown interest in the subject before. Trump's came as a bit of a surprise. Uh, I'll tell you, the 10 women took it very seriously. But as it turns out, the council was not just for show. In fact, Canada may have lessons to learn from the U.S. when it comes to giving women a boost. Take, for instance, government spending. The U.S. targets women-owned businesses. In the United States, where... The federal government pays, basically allocates about 5% of their spending towards women-owned programs. And guess what? In Canada, women represent only 7% of companies that have 100 to 500 uh, employees. In the United States, it's 14%. So I think this concept of, wow, how can we also help uh, women-owned businesses uh, and diversity in our supplier program, it all helps um, bring more people into the economy. As we think about how we level the playing field for... If Canada is listening to the ideas, turns out the U.S. president might be too. His daughter Ivanka, a senior advisor and entrepreneur herself, participated in the council's work regularly. Yes means yes and no means no! What the group did not expect is how a budding social movement, Me Too, would reinforce one of their key findings, that women entrepreneurs sometimes avoid meetings for fear it could be perceived as a sexual encounter. We really need to ensure that there is a way to build trust. And we have to be careful about, um, we have to make sure that as we go forward, we create opportunities for men and women to continue to work together and build these trusting relationships. The council says this is just a start. There'll be a series of other reports to improve the chances of women in the business world. The council reports directly to the Prime Minister and the President. Headlines in the UK are calling loneliness an epidemic, a silent plague. Coming up later in The National, the situation in Canada as the UK wages a campaign against loneliness, including ads like this one. Hello, this is John. Um, I'm not in at the moment, but uh, you can leave a message for me. Uh, please leave a message. Remember what he was charged with. He was portrayed as a heinous terrorist criminal, a mass murderer. For more than a decade, French authorities accused Canadian Hassan Diab of being a terrorist, despite flimsy evidence connecting him to a Paris bombing. Canada extradited him to France, where he spent the last 38 months in solitary confinement. With all charges dropped, he's now back in Canada. Today, I sat down with Hassan Diab. Glad you're back in Canada. Oh, very much. It's been it's been three days. What was it like at the airport? It was a ni very nice surprise actually to see the kids, Rania, and the support committee, 
waiting at the airport, and uh, it was just wonderful after so long, after 1154 days. I used to dream of that day, but I said, oh, no, maybe not, it will not happen. But it happened. Uh, so miracles could happen. And it was 22 hours a day in solitary confinement? In one building, yeah. You had no connection with the outside world. So you don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And then you have to speculate. And speculating is a very hard thing, especially when you are in the middle of the night. And most of the times, you wake up in the middle of the night and uh, just you wait for the time to pass. And uh, then you have to be innovative to start reading. So books were the ultimate like friend. Let's go back to the case against you, um, the, the synagogue bombing. Should anyone doubt your innocence? If the judges are convinced, that's, for me, that's mission accomplished. And in France, they look for the truth. It's a different system. Sure. The burden of proof is on you. Mm. So I had to prove this. But in general, generally speaking, most of the Canadians, I would say, the overwhelming majority believe now my story. Well, it, in your case, the Ontario Superior Court said that France's case was, this was a quote, convoluted, very confusing, with conclusions that are suspect. And yet, your government sent you away, allowed I, you to be extradited. I can add one thing also the judge here said. There is no prospect of conviction in a fair trial. Mm. And to say this on the one hand, and to do the opposite, on the other hand, to send this person when there's no prospect of conviction. Isn't that a little bit crazy? I mean, do you, they, you were extradited even all, given all those conclusions? This is, I'm talking about the craziness of this extradition law. So the judge felt, you know, with tight hands. But the politicians could have done something, could they not have? Absolutely. The minister, justice minister at the time, Probably could have done yeah. a lot because he had the ultimate veto. Even if the judges did what the law, the lousy law, I call it, if uh, the judges did it according to the law, he could have said, no, wait a minute, because in the extradition, even the extradition law sa says, like, we send only people for trial, not three years and two Detention. months before no trial, no nothing, no uh, charges. What would you say to the victims of that crime um, who are still obviously want, want this to be closed, want, want someone to blame? What would you say to those people? I don't think they want someone to blame. They want somebody who's responsible for that to blame. Yes. There should be like real work to find the real people who did this. But from the onset, I started saying like, I, and I reiterate this, I condemn this, and it doesn't have to, you know, to find anybody just to close the dossier and say, okay, we've done our work. This is not how justice works. How do you feel about this country now? Well, the country, any country Canada. in the world for me is, is not just trees and rivers and uh, mountains or whatever, it's people. And people I love and people who supported me are here. Actually, if I, I would say I would attribute my existence today here for, for, to these people, my family and these people who kept saying, don't give up, don't give up every letter. S keep going, hang on. We will not let you down. We will do everything, you know. I kept fighting mainly because of this family and these people who supported me. Are you surprised at your own strength? I think the strength came from, you know, what the, out, the potential outcome. Mm -hmm. And it was, it paid off. It's the adjusting process, which sure. takes, I don't know how long. And you wake up in the middle of the night, and where am I now? And I have these kids, they sleep, you know, one here, one right, one left. The first night, I just kept watching the little one for the whole night. I didn't sleep. He was asleep next to me, and then I kept looking. Is it possible? I don't want to lose 
you know, uh, waste time. I want to keep, I want to watch him. And th last night, too, though he likes to kick a lot. <laughs> We asked our Evan Dyer to take a deeper look at that extradition law and why it has so many critics. Hassan Diab says he doesn't want compensation. My main mission for the time being is to help get rid of this, of the existing, I call it lousy extradition law. Canada has extradition treaties with over 30 countries, including undemocratic Cuba. Diab's lawyer Don Bain says he accepts the need for extradition to some places in some cases. But Canada's balance has swung too far in always delivering up our citizens to the requesting states and not protecting our own citizens here. Canada also doesn't require sworn testimony. A foreign official need only sign a piece of paper that makes allegations against a Canadian. How do, you, how do you defend against that? Under Canadian law, the only way is for the Canadian to prove to the court that the information used against them is manifestly unreliable, reversing the normal onus for the prosecution to prove its case. How are you going to conduct an investigation about what is alleged in the piece of paper from a jail cell? Extradition of citizens can also be a one-way street. France, for example, prohibits the extradition of its own citizens. For four decades, France has refused to extradite film director Roman Polanski to the U.S., even though he pleaded guilty to having sex with a 13-year-old girl and then fled the country. Today, the Trudeau government said changes could be coming. The minister is seeking guidance from her officials regarding the effectiveness of existing protections in the Extradition Act and has asked them to look at any lessons learned in relation to this case. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa. Right after the break, part of the Nationals' ongoing series, Going Legal, as she delves into the quest for bigger, better, danker weed. Susan Ormiston separates hype from hard science. Every time you get Bubba Kush, it should taste and smell like Bubba Kush. It should behave like Bubba Kush. While it is the case in grapes and apples, you can't say the same for marijuana. Really, you could put into the package, you could name it anything you want. Cannabis connoisseurs face a question. What strain are you today? Golden Goat, Laughing Buddha, Mango Kush. It's a head-spinning variety, but is this just marketing spin? As part of the Nationals' ongoing coverage of cannabis going legal, Susan Ormiston looks at the science of the strains. Uh, this is the Katsu Bubba Kush, uh, the screw head, the alien Bubba. This is the Moby Dick. Um, Moby Dick is fantastic for stress, and it's got like a really kind of citrusy sweet nose. It Sound like a sommelier? The nose, the citrus influence. This is uh, our lemon burst, also known to be kind of euphoric and energizing. Uh, but this is cannabis, and catchy names define strains which are supposed to do different things. And this one here is really awesome, called the Red Diesel. It's very creative. It also makes you feel relaxed. There's no anxiety with the red diesel. At this dispensary in Hamilton, Clint Young gets his weed from dozens of licensed growers. Uh, you could see a thousand lemon bursts, and you may see a thousand awesome different lemon bursts. It just depends on the grower. So what is in a name, and how do you know what you're getting in, say, lemon burst? Those are our top seven strains right now. As cannabis emerges from the black market to become a legitimate cash crop, it's going to have to tidy up its lineage. You know, if we want to be taken seriously about this and we want to get into a real agricultural game where we're breeding varieties of marijuana like we breed strawberries and tomatoes and potatoes, then we're not going to be able to just throw names around like this forever. But Sean Miles studies plant say, genetics, fruit actually, at Dalhousie University in Kentville, Nova Scotia. And so if you, if you, if you look at a, a, a correlation between the two... If cannabis is going to be a major crop like apples, he says, people need to know what they're getting, and they're not. Miles' team took a deep dive into what's in a strain name and turns out not a lot. We looked at 81 different marijuana strains, things like Alaskan ice, Hawaiian snow, Bubba Kush, 
So what's the differences between all those strains? It's often the case that these names that they've associated with these marijuana strains do not represent any sort of meaningful genetic identity. Every time you get Bubba Kush, it should taste and smell like Bubba Kush. It should behave like Bubba Kush. What we found is that that's not actually the case in marijuana. While it is the case in grapes and apples, you can't say the same for marijuana. To better understand, here's some weed wisdom. Cannabis has a long history. It's grown almost everywhere, and it's been interbred for centuries. Generally, though, it's defined as being one of two species, either indica or sativa. Then there are hybrids, dozens of strains that are combinations of the two, with different effects, and that's how it's marketed. But in Sean's study, often the genetics did not live up to their billing. We've come up with a method of saying that, okay, this big pool of strains, let's assume that it's made from two different species. One species is red and one species is blue. If you're completely red, then you're 100% sativa. So Dr. Grinspoon here, that's a strain name, and it's reported to be 100% sativa, and our results are largely in agreement with that. But in this case here, Jamaican lamb's bread, that's a strain name, is reported to be 100% sativa, but we find it's, that's completely inconsistent. A, almost a complete blue bar here would indicate that that's not consistent with our genetic results at all. Over 30% of the strains Sean studied did not match their ancestry. What we found is that while one producer will be producing Bubba Kush and selling it as Bubba Kush, when we look at the DNA level and test, is it the same as this other Bubba Kush that this person is selling? Often it's the case that they are not the same genetically. But currently there is no legislation to say that you have to quality control this product. Uh, there are controls on the quality of the product, but not on the naming of the uh, variety or the strain. Uh, but those names are largely meaningless and we need to move towards a system where these things are quantified by the medicinal components inside the, inside the strain and the effects that they have on the, on the user. Currently, licensed growers must list THC levels and test for things like pesticides. But naming conventions, well, that's wide open, leaving large gaps in consistency. Mark Zakulin is president of Canopy Growth, a regulated cannabis breeder in Smiths Falls, Ontario. Yeah, you know, it is like a wine or it is like a whiskey where, uh, you know, you have very different taste profiles, very different smell profiles and very different effect profiles, which is, I think, the very interesting part about cannabis. His mission is to grow weed with strong, identifiable genetic markers, new strains that are what they say they are. When we start, we'll start with a thousand different seeds and we'll watch them grow up, but it's not Monsanto yet. It's not a, a, a set of seeds that will just um, yield the same thing uh, every time. It's a function of seeds and secret formulas. Then interbreeding to come up with new and consistent strains. Yeah, so what you're seeing right here in my hand is a number of seeds that nobody's ever seen before and may turn out to be the next great genetic. What you're looking at is a cross between Candyland and Apple Pie, two different varieties. Uh, the Candyland selected for its beautiful color, texture, and so on, matched with the Apple Pie for the strength of the bud and the plant, etc. We'll go to a lot of effort to document the stability of the process, the traits, so that we can ultimately have plant breeders' rights and protect this variety going into the future. If cannabis is to be the next big crop, it will have to clean up its genetics with varieties consumers can trust. Susan Ormiston, CBC News. Now, growing pot takes electricity, a lot of it. How much? Well, it's hard to say for sure, but one 2012 study found 1% of all U.S. electricity use went to pot cultivation. That's stunning for a single crop. U.S. farms for everything else use about the same amount. In Washington state, a 2013 estimate put the amount of juice needed to grow one pound of weed at 2,000 kilowatt hours. That is enough to power a home for two months. Now, the challenge for the industry as it goes legal is how to squeeze every drop of potency and profit from each kilowatt. So our question of the day is, is the grid ready?
From those in the know, tucked away researching lights and power and plants in San Francisco, there's a warning for Canada. There's a significant drain that's coming Canada's way, and uh, we're seeing Really, it's, attack, it's a uh, stress on their electrical transmission systems. Yes, cannabis has long been grown indoors, mostly to keep it away from the cops. Being energy or cost efficient with the lights wasn't an issue with profits so high. Okay, so let's have a look at some of these. Yeah. The colors are, uh, I feel like I'm at a bit of a rave here. Yeah. <laughs> but now that the business is coming out of the basements and closets, bright minds can innovate in the open exploring the ways LEDs can foster faster, cheaper, and smarter growth. These are chrysanthemum plants they're tinkering with, by the way. They behave just like cannabis. What we have here is a situation where you can control different ratios of light. And as you control those ratios, the plant will respond in a different way. What does that actually look like? Uh, Jake, if you can just reverse that. OK, there we go. Thanks. So here's a high blue environment. And again, this is what would give probably anticipated a much higher TAC content. Concentrated growth at 50% of the energy cost. So you're not wasting, you're, you're sort of targeting your energy, you're not, you're not wasting it. Yeah, I like to use the term precision agriculture. Why not just grow outside? Well, this is Canada. Cold winters, long summer days, it's a mess. So that means every year in our climate, you can only have one crop. So you have to have indoor. Yubin Zhang of the University of Guelph says Canada is the world leader in greenhouse production. So combine that with emerging LED tech that can effectively trick the plants into growing precisely when and how they're needed. And the potential here is huge, not just for cannabis. Think solving a food crisis. Farmlands getting smaller and smaller, cities getting bigger and bigger. And uh, if you could uh, build vertical farm in the middle of the city. You can produce many times more plant material than you could do outside of the city. Eventually, uh, the technologies involved in cannabis production, the spin-off certainly can be used to help our uh, vertical farming and indoor farming. And food designed to be more nutritious. That's a happy side effect of the cannabis research. The race is now on to get that research up to speed. So when the commerce of cannabis hits in Canada, growers can tap into the efficient tech and not sap the grid. As Canada prepares to go legal, we have much more coverage of the pot industry for you online, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram at CBC The National. On The National tonight, we're hearing from the family of the 11-year-old girl who falsely claimed that a man tried to cut off her hijab. The girl's family is apologizing, saying when they heard about the attack, they also assumed it was true. Their statement continued, this has been a very painful experience for our family. We want to thank everyone who has shown us support at this difficult time. Again, we're deeply sorry for this and want to express our sincere apologies to every Canadian. We're getting a closer look at a Sunwing plane that caught fire after clipping another aircraft at Toronto's Pearson Airport. The Transportation Safety Board has released some images from the collision. The Sunwing plane was being towed with no passengers, but the WestJet plane that it hit had just landed and its passengers evacuated by emergency slide. If you've never been lonely, you don't realize what it is like. It feels as though you've been dumped in the deep end and there's nobody there to rescue you. You go hours and hours and never speak to anybody. That's from a story that helped trigger an outpouring of support for lonely seniors in Britain and made the issue a government priority. Well, tonight, Prime Minister May called social isolation among people of all ages a national concern. She's appointed a cabinet minister to try to solve the problem. And that got us wondering, is national loneliness strategy something Canada needs too? Christine Birak has more on that. It's not a topic people are eager to stop and chat about, but it's the reason why many of these retirees are here. Oh! A chance to be with people. Unfortunately, I lost my husband to cancer 16 months ago, so this has been a uh, great, great thing for me to get out and to 
instead of being lonely at home. Well, I live by myself, uh, so yeah, the loneliness is there. Statistics Canada says 1.4 million seniors report feeling lonely, and it's not just the elderly. The sadness that comes from being lonely, it, uh, it, it destroys me, my, it destroys my psyche. It makes me more insecure. And a growing number of Canadians are living alone. 28% of us in 2016, making singles the most common type of household in the country. There are almost 40 million hits right now talking about minister loneliness. The British government's decision to appoint a lead on loneliness has certainly struck a nerve, but this psychiatrist isn't convinced it will help. One can understand the temptation then for a big government announcement and a big government push, but I'm not confident this will do much. The root causes of loneliness vary. For some, anxiety and depression may play a role. For others, issues can range from age and illness to family relationships. Ultimately, this is a human problem. Uh, human problems are difficult for governments to resolve. How do we deal with the fact that people don't reach out to their elderly relatives? I'm not sure a minister is going to be able to resolve that in Britain or in Canada or anywhere else. Mm. This senior scientist says while that's true, the health impacts of loneliness rival smoking and Canadians may benefit from a more targeted approach. I think a more systematic uh, national uh, program in this area should be certainly something, something to be considered. Because reaching out and finding ways to connect can be life-saving. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. And here we are in three different cities, three different boxes, and yet I don't feel lonely at all. Me neither. <laughs> that is The National for January 17th. Good night. Good night. Good night.